Michael Church, Crawl Space Ninja. I'm here with Michael Pinto from Wonders Maker Environmental. And uh, for those of you that don't know, we did a video a couple of weeks back about understanding mold sensitivities. And uh, if you know someone that's got some major mold sensitivities, I'm going to put a link to that video down below. But today we're going to talk to you about can crawl space mold contamination affect health? Stay tuned. So if you're new to Crawl Space Ninja, we talk about everything related to indoor air quality, mold testing, remediation. We hope you'll subscribe to our channel, ring that notifications bell, make sure you follow us on Facebook, check out our DIY store and our franchise opportunity. Okay, Michael, I really appreciate you uh, joining us again for another great call. I tell you, that, that, uh, that call, I learned a lot and uh, appreciate you uh, sharing that information with us. So how are you doing up there in the state of Michigan? Well, we're doing fine, and you uh, may have noticed I put a vest on. It's getting a little cooler up here, so uh, yeah. but we're all good. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cold here today, too. It's 28 degrees, I think, when I got up this morning. East Tennessee, that's pretty chilly. So uh, uh, listen, one of the things I wanted to ask you was when we first spoke, when I approached you about being a guest on our YouTube channel, you asked me a question, and it struck me, and I wrote it down. Um, you asked me directly if encapsulated crawl space, uh, prior to encapsulating the crawl space, if we addressed mold prior to encapsulation. Can you kind of share with our viewers why you asked me that question? Well, part of that was because, uh, you know, I kind of got hit out of the blue, didn't really know a lot about Crawl Space Ninja. And quite honestly, I was just trying to figure out if you actually knew what you were talking about or whether I was just going to blow you off as somebody who was, you know, not very skilled in the industry. And, and again, I have to admit that uh, since we have chatted and everything, I've been very impressed with your organization. And part of that is because of the answer to that initial question. And what you said was that, yes, you have to deal with the mold before we can encapsulate the crawl space before we can deal with that. Too many uh, people that deal with crawl spaces, you know, whether they're spraying spray foam and saying, well, the spray foam will kill it uh, up in the rafters or on the subfloor, or, well, we're going to wrap everything with plastic, and so it doesn't really matter whether we uh, remove the mold before we wrap it in plastic because it's all going to be sealed and it's never going to go anywhere. And the uh, fact of the matter is, and I think you understand this, Michael, and it certainly seems like you do, uh, but what your viewers and what your clients need to understand is that, yes, it's a crawl space. Yes, we understand it's unoccupied. But there is a connection between the crawl space and the house. And I don't care how well we encapsulate that. I don't care how well we wrap it in plastic or spray foam it or do whatever we do to it. There's always going to be some gaps. There's going to be some coverage, uh, leakage, so to speak. So that if there's mold in the crawl space, eventually some of that gets in the house. And because my expertise is with sensitized individuals, if you've got a really nicely encapsulated crawl space and they didn't take care of the mold before they did that, the average homeowner may not have any problems. It might be enough just to keep it you know, low concentrations and only a little bit leaking into the house up above and all of that. But for sensitized individuals, they, I mean, I had a conversation this week with a gentleman and he called in a restoration contractor. He was so sensitive, he could smell or sense the mold in the wall. And the contractor put an infrared camera on it and told him he didn't want to take his money and all of that. And the man insisted that he build a containment and then he take out a wall around a window where he knew the mold was. And they stripped that drywall. Honest to goodness, Michael, they found an area, according to my um, colleague, about that big, maybe a little bigger than a 50 cent piece. Wow. And the sensitized individual knew it was in there. He knew that when he got close to that wall and that window, it was bothering him. And of course, the joke after that was the contractor said, you could be my mold dog. I can take you to my projects and stuff. And the gentleman said, you know, it, it sounds like an interesting opportunity, but he, he can't afford to risk his health 
uh, to do that sort of work. But that's how sensitive these people are. So to think that a little bit of mold downstairs in the crawl space is going to be okay, and then, oh yeah, we're, we're going to encapsulate it afterwards, and that's going to make it even better. That's not the scenario for a lot of our, um, unfortunately, for our sensitized individuals. Yeah, and uh, and you know I, I appreciate you asking that information when we first talked about it too, because you know that's that's one of the things we want to get across is that you know you got to do everything you can to address the mold, um, you know, prior to encapsulation, and and you know part of that is also addressing humidity and standing water, and you know you can't do proper mold remediation if the floor joists are moist and you got you know 75, 80 percent relative humidity. So you know it's 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 a mold protocol that you follow, right? There, so there's standards and practices in place to make sure that the mold is addressed properly. So that's why I wanted to bring that up at this point. And I appreciate you answering that for us. Uh, so- can, can I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna interrupt if I can. No, no, go ahead. Just wanna add to what you were talking about there. Um, you know, there is a protocol. And one of the things that I see and people ask us quite often is how is it that I can, help to determine whether somebody who's coming in and says that they're gonna fix my mold issues, whether it be in a crawl space or in the house or whatever it is, are there red flags that I need to ask them about? And the, the first thing that we tell them is that if they're not removing the source material, if they're gonna come in and all they wanna do is fog or all they wanna do is spray this, you know, I, I am a little bit, um, you know, critical here, but I will say, you know, they're going to spray the magic juice, whatever it is. And there's lots of different, um, you know, formulations and things out there. And I'll tell you what, Michael, I am all in favor of fogging and spraying and that sort of stuff, but it's always as a complement to the actual removal. It's not a replacement for the removal. So that would be my biggest uh, piece of advice to anybody who's watching this video is that if you're going to have remediation done, make sure it's real remediation, not uh, pseudo remediation. Right. For example, in a living space, you may have, you know, drywall or, or gypsum or whatever it is you all call it, depending on what part of the country you're in. And when I went through mold remediation training, they would recommend anything over 10 square feet uh, is a good, you know, a good measure for that should be removed and bagged and taken out of the home. Well, unfortunately, in a crawl space, we can't remove the floor joists and the subfloor. So in that instance, we actually use soda blasting, uh, which is like sandblasting, but with sodium bicarbonate to strip mm -hmm. the visible or the physical mold off of those uh, permanent wood uh, prior to applying our mold cleaner. So, you know, in a living space, you would approach mold protocols a little differently than in a crawl space. Agreed? Well, I think you use similar techniques. I mean, you're physically removing it, whether you're doing soda blasting or removing the drywall. But, um, you know, some of the uh, crews will actually use the soda blasting upstairs once they get the drywall out, too, because you have the residual on the studs and on the sill plate and that sort of stuff. So at that point, whether you're doing vacuuming and scrubbing or uh, soda blasting or dry ice blasting or any of the other physical removal techniques, but it still is the removal, just like you're talking about down in the crawl space. You can't just fog it and say, well, our fog is going to dissolve it. It's going to kill it. There's that's great information there. Yeah. Well, that's great, Michael. So let me let me ask you this. What type of testing can a homeowner do to indicate correctly uh, if the mold is present, you know, at the and you know, what are the potential unhealthy levels in the environment. So, you know, there's different types of mold testing. So what kind of testing can be done? And then I don't think there's a standard for levels. Is that correct? So tell us a little bit about how they can determine whether their environment might be uh, a little on the unhealthy side based on the amount of mold they find. Well, thank you very much. So first of all, the simplest way is the, you know, visual inspection. If you see something that looks like mold and it smells like mold, um, you know, my uh, famous line, of course, is if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. If it looks like mold, smells like mold, probably is mold. I don't know if I would do any testing at that point. Um, 
it just depends on what else needs to be done. Now, if you've got people that are ill in the house and you think that might be related to the mold, it might be a good thing to have a pre-sample and then a post-sample to make sure you're making real progress and you're not leaving things behind. So that's good. Um, and the samples, uh, there's several different ways. Probably the most uh, common uh, sampling technique is what they call a spore trap cassette. It's a vacuum pump, uh, air is uh, sucked in. It's generally a 10 minute sample. And uh, then the uh, particulates in the air are collected inside this cassette. This uh, piece of equipment or supply goes off to the laboratory and they actually do a visual read of it. They put it underneath the microscope and they physically identify spores and fibers and dust particles and that sort of stuff. And um, the good labs actually can give you quantitative levels of the different types of spores. And, and uh, that's, that's been the standard for about 20 years. And I see that continuing probably for another decade or so. Although there's other sampling methods that are out there that are starting to generate a little steam. The difficulty on the alternate sampling methods is the price right now. Right. So you're looking at you know, anything from, uh, you know, $65, 70 for a spore trap sample up to a couple hundred dollars. Uh, and some of the other samples that you're looking at, uh, uh, there's one called Air Answers, which has got a lot of promise, but uh, that's typically going to be three, four, five hundred dollars $500. So uh, when that price gap starts to shrink a little bit, you may see some different, um, uh, sampling techniques and things, but I think right now the spore traps are really the way to go. As far as what it means when you get the numbers at, that's probably the most important part of the whole deal, is that the, um, the one standard that's in the industry right now is called the S520, and they have a criteria that they call normal fungal ecology, and that's a understanding that there's mold in the world around us and in everybody's houses just on a natural basis. What you don't want is anything more than what would be typical or normal. Right. And then depending on how sensitive you are or if you have been made sensitive or been sensitized, you may not even be able to accept the normal level. You may have to be way down. You may have to be at a substantially cleaner than normal. So um, I would also point out that another reason that the spore trap samples are so common today is that, uh, yes, there's a lot of professionals that take the samples and stuff, but there's really good uh, do-it-yourself um, sampling methodologies. And indeed, uh, Crawl Space Ninja uh, has access to one, and I can show your viewers what that is. That is uh, kind of a, what we call the Wonder Air Sampler here. You can see there's two different color hoses and uh, that allows them to collect a uh, indoor sample and an outdoor sample at the same time. Because as I said, if you're going to uh, try and figure out what's normal for your um, individual house or, or building or something like that, you, you do want to compare it to what's going on on the outside. So you were talking about being in East Tennessee and being cold this morning. And um, if there isn't a snow cover, a lot of times that first real big temperature drop will force a lot of the mold in the natural environment to what we call sporulate. So then the spores go crazy. So this morning you could have had a much higher spore concentration outside than you did you know, a couple of days ago when it was even warmer. And uh, so if you're going to measure inside the house, you have to have a comparison sample outside that helps you figure out what that normal is or whether you're worse than normal. Well, I got to be honest with you, Michael, before I got before I met you, before we started talking, uh, at least around here, the only mold testing was someone you hired uh, that would come into your home and uh you know normally they would charge like you said around here i think it's 150 to 200 dollars per sample so that would be the indoor 
the outdoor. So there's three hundred dollars if it's hundred dollar, hundred fifty per sample. Plus, uh, you know, they would they would probably you know do one in the bedroom and and then all those indoor ones would be compared to that one outdoor one. So when I learned that you had a DIY opportunity for people to test their own homes. And uh, it's I've seen the the product. It's easily labeled, easy to follow. You pack everything back up. You send it back uh, to your lab that you all do the quantitative analysis on. Is that right? And then uh, and then you yes. send a report to the homeowner, and and it they know exactly what they're dealing with. So uh, that's that's great. And and I'm I'm super excited about that. That's why Crawl Space Ninja wanted to be a part of that, to where people could go on our DIY store. DIY.crawlspaceninja.com. They can check the samples for themselves and and uh, make sure that gets done properly. Because you know I've met a lot of mold inspectors that uh, you know didn't really know what they were doing, to be quite honest. Or they'd send it off to some lab that that's not whatever. So it's nice to that they have this resource for our for our viewers to to follow. So thanks for doing that for us. Well, that's very kind of you to say. And I will just point out that yes, it comes back to us. We look at the samples here in our laboratory. And probably the most important thing, however, I mean, there's other laboratories that do good analysis as well. I don't want to suggest that Wondermakers is the only one or even the best or anything like that. What I will say, however, is that we understand the data, I think, better than most organizations in the industry. So explaining what the results mean to the client, we just get uh, tons and tons of of uh, compliments on that. And as a matter of fact, uh, I often will review other people's samples uh, with them and for them and help to explain and, and even point out where somebody said, well, this was okay or, or you know, you didn't have a problem. And then I look at the data and you can say, or we look at it here at Wondermakers and we can easily say, uh, well, I, that doesn't appear to be the case. And I think some of that is just because we both do the inspections in the field and we do the analysis and then we also help people with the post remediation afterwards so we kind of have a, a really good handle on it at all three steps well, that's great now if you don't mind go over some of the uh you know there's molds everywhere like you said you know and from what i understand even within certain uh, classifications of mold, like penicillium, for example, there's even different types of penicillium uh, right. within penicillium, right? So it's, if you don't mind, share some of the, those, you know, more bad molds. Uh, obviously, everybody's heard of black mold, which is stachybotrys, you know, you know, everybody's heard of, what are some of the others that, that could be a red flag to a person's health, if you don't mind, that might show up on a report? Sure. So in, in our view of things here at Wondermakers and, and actually what has you know, also caught on in the rest of the industry, there's two terms that we use. One is called an indicator mold, and that tends to, as the name would suggest, indicate that you've got a mold problem in the house. Not necessarily 100% definitive, but it, it certainly is a, a, a yellow caution flag, so to speak. The, the red flag, as you talked about, those are what we would call the target spores. Those are spores that uh, tend to have a lot of health effects, uh, tend to be um, very uh, water specific. They have to have a lot of water for a, a fair period of time. So they're not going to develop in a few days. You know, these are going to be weeks or months that the house or part of the house has been wet before you start to see these spores and that sort of stuff. And, um, and they don't go airborne very well. The spores tend to be spread by the water distribution. So if we catch any of these in the air, we have, at Wondermakers, we literally have a zero tolerance for what we call these target spores. So some of the names on those, uh, you, you talked about stachybotrys, there's ketomium, that's probably the second most common one, um, fusarium, uh, trichoderma, so there's a handful of them, but they all share those same properties. They're water loving molds, they're slow to grow, they tend not to put their spores in the air. So if the spores are in the air, that means that either there's a really aggressive growth area somewhere or it's been disturbed. And that's how the spores have started to get kicked around or something to that effect. 
Could these molds also uh, come from, say, a very humid environment, like uh, you know, a crawl space that that's been just humid year after year? Is that, or does it have to be like a water leak from a plumbing or something like that? Typically, the the excess humidity uh, where it condenses. So, yes, your situation, um, you know, is not necessarily a wet crawl space. There's not puddles down there, but it's. It is a crawl space. It's in a southern climate, perhaps, and it's a little bit more humid. Doesn't tend to dry out in the winter time like it does up here, up uh, farther north. Uh, those are also classic conditions because that humidity goes somewhere, and it right. usually rises up and it settles on. As you have seen many, many times, the subfloor, the uh, joist, and uh, sill plates, and things like that, and. All it takes, whether that water is from a leak or from condensation, is the water sitting there long enough, and then those uh, molds will start to form. Those so turn. if, uh, I'm sorry, so so if Stachybotrys and, and Fusarium, I think you said it was one of them, if those don't typically get airborne very often, and as you mentioned, if they show up in an air sample, that's obviously uh, a bad thing, then what is it about those molds that could that could be a health effect on the person. Is that the mycotoxin? Is that correct? That is correct. See, a lot of these, um, if you think about it, there's there's two ways that the molds are going to try and survive in nature. And some of them, the indicator molds that we didn't talk about, they just go fast and furious. We're just we're going to outgrow our competition. If the if the humidity levels right, if the water's there, if there's nutrients. We're just going to grow big blooms of these things. It's like dandelions in your yard, right? Uh, once the one starts and the seeds spread, boom, your whole lawn is full of dandelions. That would be your indicator molds. We start seeing the, uh, quote, dandelion um, seed types of spores in your house, if you will, and that's going to tell us that there's a problem. The, the slower growing molds, these target molds, their whole way of surviving is much different. It's like, ooh, we can't compete. We don't grow that fast. So what we're going to do is we're just going to create a poison so that as we stretch out and, and grow our colony, it may be slow, but anything that we touch, these fast growing molds that are going to be next to us, we're just, uh, we're just going to kill them. And it reminds me, I don't know if you're a Star Trek fan at all, but it reminds me of the Borg. You know, we're just going to absorb everything and then it will actually kill the other molds and use it for nutrients and keep growing. Well, if it's creating a poison that is enough to kill other molds, kill bacteria that might be competing for the same space, kill mold worms, there's, a, there's actually these things called mold worms that eat the mold, um, more beetles. If it's poison enough to kill an insect or kill a worm, eh, you know, you got to think, I don't want it in me. So that's why they call these specific poisons toxins. And if it's associated with mold, then the, the terminology, as you suggest, is they, they put a myco in front of it, uh, and then it's a mycotoxin. So these molds are at war with each other. And we're called in the crossfire. Is that basically what you're telling me? Is these? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. There was a fascinating study. I don't mean to bore you with this, but there's a fascinating study way back in about 2001 because it was part of a legal case. And um, someone was trying to prove that the stachybotrys isn't that dangerous. And so they grew it in the laboratory and they kept testing it and testing it for mycotoxins. And they said, see, look, we had these 20 different samples. We grew it in the laboratory. We couldn't get any mycotoxins off it at all. And, and then at one point, somebody came back to them and said, but you're growing it in the laboratory in a Petri dish that didn't have anything else around it. It had everything it needed. It had the moisture, the nutrient source. It didn't need to create a, a toxin at that point. It was spending its energy growing. And they took some of these same Petri dishes where they couldn't find any mycotoxins and they inoculated either bacteria or different types of mold, you know, an inch or two away from where this uh, stachybotrys colony was. And literally within hours, they were starting to see that it was producing the mycotoxins. And even more fascinating, 
producing the mycotoxins on the side facing where the, the threat was coming from. That's I mean, amazing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the studies on this stuff, when you really dig into it, if you, you can kind of tell I'm definitely geeky about this. Well, the, the other thing I, I, again, verify this for me, but the other thing I've heard is that these molds can get uh, defensive if you try to kill them, right? So if you apply something or you, or you disturb them, in other words, and I remember being a kid, you know, I grew up around cows and, and all that, and there was these big balls of, of basically a mushroom out in the cow field, and it was fine, but if you went and kicked it, spores just went everywhere so that's kind of the way i i relate to mold is if you disturb it if you kick it it's going to spore and mycotoxin is that is that also correct it is and even if you apply a chemical i don't know going all the way back to the beginning of the conversation about just trying to fog stuff um you know the the mold senses if you will i know that's probably not the right term but it senses that it's under threat from the fog and it can actually uh, disperse spores. It will go into a kind of an emergency escape mode and put spores into the air. And then again, if it's a fogging process, hopefully the fog is dense enough to get to it and maybe, you know, encapsulate it or drop it to the ground or whatever. But you, that's what I said before. You can actually make things worse if you're not going after the source material and you're just trying to fog something as compared to um, uh, treatment seriously. So if you're that zealous homeowner that sees a little bit of black or something growing on the drywall and you just start hitting it with a hammer and getting that stuff out of there, you could actually be making things worse if you're not careful. Is that is that correct? I would tell you that um, a good share, at least 75%, maybe even 80% of uh, the sensitized individuals that we have talked to, their primary exposure came from bad remediation, either because they did it themselves or unfortunately, hired somebody who didn't put up proper isolation barriers. We talked a little bit about this in our first video and stuff. Right. Yeah, if you, don't, if you don't protect yourself and you don't protect the rest of the environment, trying to get rid of the mold can actually make it worse for the occupants than if you didn't do anything at all. Well, that's some great stuff, man. I also think of mold as, and, and I don't know if mold is a plant or an animal. I think it's kind of both. Is that kind of how they classify it? It's a little bit of both? It's, it is its own uh, class of organisms. It's in the fungi uh, classification and that you're right. It's, it's kind of a um, interim zone between plants and animals and insects and that sort of stuff. So, so it's own classification. Wow, this is fascinating. This is fascinating. Real quick, do you mind giving me like an ABCD of a, of a standard mold, mold protocol? And again, for the viewers, this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't for your specific scenario. These are just some of the things that you want to make sure your contractors are doing. You mind sharing that with us, Michael, and then we will close. Have, is that okay? I have no problem doing that, and I'd be happy to do that. And it doesn't matter whether it's our protocol or someone else's protocol. They should be following the standard of care for the industry. So it's going to involve a few things like this. You're going to isolate whatever area you have identified the mold or where you think the mold is. You're going to utilize uh, what they call uh, engineering control. So that's going to be negative pressure and that's your air filtration device with the HEPA uh, filters on them and things like that. You're going to create a pressure differential so that air is moving toward your work zone instead of away from it. And then that way, as you start to disturb the mold and just, it, you know, the, the bad analogy is you have to break an egg to make an omelet, right? Uh, you're going to have to disturb the mold to get rid of it. And so as you're disturbing that, and the, when we know those spores are going to go into the air, that way the, the air from the rest of the building is coming toward you and you're not allowing the air with the spores on it to escape to the outside. So isolation, negative pressure, um, personal protective equipment for the people that are doing the work. That means that they put on protective suits. And quite honestly, that's a dual uh, protection. It's for the people that are doing the work. But the most important thing is so that they can take that off as they're coming out of the work zone. So they're not spreading whatever spores landed on their clothes as they walk through the rest of the building to get out to the truck or do whatever they have to do. So personal protective equipment, that would also include some respirators. Um, just careful handling of the material, bagging it so that 
you're not, again, creating a dust cloud. Uh, you've got all your analogies and stuff. Sometimes I think of bad mold remediation. I think of the old uh, Peanuts cartoon with pig pen and right. he's marching along and there's this giant dust cloud that just seems to follow him of dirt. And uh, you can see some of the contractors uh, sometimes, uh, I can just envision the mold cloud following them. Um, yeah, so then you get stuff out of the house and then you do some detailed cleaning and that's HEPA vacuums and stuff. So that's the basics. Anything you want to add to that? We talked about the fogging. Uh, some people add foaming. Uh, you can encapsulate afterwards, which you know uh, puts a preventative on the surfaces to help keep the mold from growing again. Uh, I would also always include if you're going, if you tear stuff out, you have to rebuild. And if you're going to rebuild, you might as well rebuild with mold-resistant material. There's a small difference. Uh, you know, if I've got even five or 10 sheets of drywall that have to go up, that's a big project for mold remediation. There's just such a small difference in cost between regular drywall and mold resistant drywall that has fiberglass on the backside instead of paper on the backside, which is just mold food. So, uh, yeah, those are the sorts of things I think are probably the, the biggest. Yeah, that's some great information. I, I tell you, I've, I've seen a uh, or heard of a lot of stories of homeowners hiring a, a mold remediation contractor and they'll have the zipper wall, they'll have the negative air and all that stuff, maybe in a bathroom, and then they rip that drywall out or that material out and then carry it out of the living space, you know, to contaminate the rest of the house. So make sure that that stuff, if there's a window that they can throw it out the window or or whatever it is, don't bring it back into the living space where the, you know, to reinfect it everywhere else. And don't let people go, uh, you know, with a suit on or whatever into those uh, clean areas, if you will, too, because uh, it's it's real easy for people to, to cross contaminate. Is that also correct? That is correct. But, um, you know, sometimes there isn't a window going out in some of these areas and that sort of stuff. And so, again, the best they can do is bag it and then, um, generally you bag it once in the work area and then put in a separate bag right at the doorway to the work area as you're going out. And uh, that way that second bag hasn't ever been inside there where it's gotten dirty and you can, you can, you know, it's, it actually is quite simple to uh, prevent a lot of the cross contamination. The real thought is that you have to want to do it and they have to be good, you know, supervised well. That's great. Well, Michael, I appreciate your time. And again, great information. And I want to have you back because I want to talk about asbestos at some point. So hopefully we'll get into that conversation as well. That's a fascinating topic, in my opinion. I was in the Navy. We had asbestos everywhere. Everybody talked about it and all that sort of stuff. So again, this is Michael Church with Michael Pinto. And we uh, we appreciate y'all watching this video. Please like the video down below. If you got a question for Michael, uh, directly uh, put that in the chat and we'll make sure he also sees it as well. We hope you make it a happy and blessed day and we'll see you later. God bless you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.